So, all right, everyone, so let's get started. Um, um, so welcome back to the second uh, lecture of the course. Um, you know, because, you know, someone asked me, we are in, so CS3130, ECE 3530, probably, and Statistics for Engineers. Okay, you're, uh, uh, um, so you're still all here. Um, um, so it's great. Um, so all right, everyone, so okay. let's get started. All right, hold on, let me. Um, um, so welcome back to. Okay, and. Um, um, so, okay, so, so, so before we get into the lecture, a few more kind of administrative notes. The, the help hours for myself and the TAs are probably finalized as well as the locations. Um, so it, if there winds up being some small issues, you might change stuff a little bit. Um, so they're, they're, um, so they're posted up here. There are help hours every day of the week. So Monday through Friday, um, my hours are on, so Thursday from nine to 10 every time, um, on, on, so Thursdays. I'm also available after class. So it's about so two hours a week for myself. Each of the TAs has about two hours. There's one half TA who's only has so one hour. Again, most of them are Mondays and Tuesdays. There is a Zoom office hour Monday evening. I need to get the link to post for that stuff. Um, so, but it's so pretty much set. If you look up here and you say, you know, I just have a really weird class schedule and somehow. There's a conflict with every one of my classes somehow. You can let me know they're still slightly flexible on these things, but but this is probably gonna be the schedule for, for the semester. Um, so, okay, so we, um, one thing I'll notice is, I, so I mentioned that there's gonna be a big, so day science day tomorrow that I encourage you all to go to. It's gonna be in the union ballroom from 10 until five or so. Um, so, um, so Mason's office hours tomorrow are going to be canceled. It's probably okay. It's the first week. Most people don't go to help hours the first week. Um, if you have questions you need to address, send me email and we'll try and, so try and handle that. Um, so, okay. Um, and then, um, oh yeah. So, so uh, I, um, you can see. Had the classroom up here, but also the link to Zoom if you're watching on Zoom, right? I'm, I'm glad I encourage you to come in class if you can. I think that's the best experience. Second best is watching live in Zoom. Um, third best, if you miss a lecture because you're sick or something came up and you couldn't make it, we post them on so YouTube as well. Um, this is still the plan. If it goes well today, then I'll say, okay, we'll do it for the rest of the semester. Some students have found that helpful to go back and watch lectures afterwards. I think YouTube is pretty much the easiest interface. That should go to a playlist, I think. Um, so I think the first lecture should be up there already. Um, okay, the, the, um, you can also, I also posted a direct link to the lecture under the video <laughs> column up there. And I'll try and do that after every, um, so after every class. I'll mostly be writing on slides. That'll go under the slides column, and the more formal notes will be under so the so the column for the topic. Um, this first lecture, it's going to be for many of you if you've taken CS twenty one hundred or discrete so math class. It's been we're going to talk about so sets and how that relates to so sample spaces, which are kind of the foundation that you build um, so probably on top of. There are a lot of so definitions today, so it's a bit easier to do this in slides as the introductory chapter. So these are slides today, but afterwards, after we get through this set of slides, we'll be mostly just writing notes on the, uh, on the iPad, and then they'll have written notes in the topics and then posted slides under the slides column. Um, so, okay. The other things to see today is that quiz zero is on the schedule for today. It will open towards the end of class. I will stop 
the lecture period about 10 minutes left in class and I'll encourage you to take the quiz then. Um, so TA Anna is here. She's one of your TAs. Say hi to Anna. She is, she will, and I will be here to help answer questions. She'll also be monitoring Zoom. Another teaching assistant will also be on Zoom to monitor questions if there are those on Zoom as well. Um, so that'll be during the last 10 or 15 minutes of class. And it's a 10 minute quiz. Recommend you take it here, but it'll be open till Friday. Okay. There, are, if you can't take it between Thursday at the end of class and Friday, that's it. It will be close. Okay. I figure that's enough slack for almost all situations. Um, okay. Other thing is homework one has been posted. Again, we'll try to do this about two weeks ahead of time, but at least a week before it's due. It's not due until, what is this, until um, January 24th, okay? Um, it's not due till January 24th, um, but, um, or 20, yeah, so 24th, but you can start working on it now or after today's lecture, you can answer some of the questions. You can get to it via this link. Okay, it's one of these. Um, this is the homework assignment. Write your name and you ID at the top. And then it's gonna look kind of like a test kind of, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a homework assignment here. Um, and again, as I mentioned, I'll expect you to kind of either print it out and write on it or to, um, to um, or to have it on an iPad and uh, write out with a stylus or to edit it with like a PDF editor or kind of Word um, because you're gonna upload it exactly in this form into Gradescope, okay? So you'll write on top of it and then you'll upload it into Gradescope. Um, a little bit of how this will work. The other main element of the course is so Canvas, um, I think this is how it should look for you. This is what it tells me is the view for the students. Um, you can see kind of the main links for the class off, off here. Um, and let's see, you can also, um, you know, there's an announcement or an announcement I made, you know, I'll make all announcements to the class through Canvas announcements. I had to shift my office hours today. Um, I hope, hope that was fine for everyone. Um, kind of their discussion boards we were going to use. We thought about using Piazza. In the past, we've used Canvas when I've run a course pretty effectively, and it's a bit more integrated, so we're going to use so Canvas. Um, we'll kind of organize the, the, the discussions into these so threads. So the general course questions, we'll post one for each of the homeworks and, and so forth. And so this is a spot for general course questions. I'll try and answer them here. and and so the TAs when they can or for various homeworks. Um, questions about how to do something in the homework are best on the discussion board than direct emails to me. I won't be able to handle all the emails from the students, but I do respond quickly to the discussion board. You'll probably get a faster response if you post the discussion board than if you email me directly, okay? Um, so the, and you could get a response from the TA even faster than me. Um, Okay, the, the assignments on here, uh, yeah, there's a quiz. The quiz will be um, in, in Canvas. Quiz zero is not available yet, but it will be at 4.45 today. That's in a little under an hour, okay? Um, the, and the assignment, your first assignment is, I guess quizzes counts as assignments, got them chronologically ordered here. Homework, homework one has been, has been uh, posted. Oh, I, I, sh I should put a link to the PDF up here as well, but you'll be submitting through, so Gradescope, you'll click the load homework one in the new window to get to Gradescope. I don't think there's a student view on there, so I'm not gonna click on there, um, but there is a link here about how to submit this if you haven't done Gradescope before. Who's used Gradescope before? And who's not used Gradescope? Okay, so you guys all know how to upload assignments to Gradescope. Much. Okay, great. It's going to be the, the fixed, there's two versions. There's like a variable length and there's a fixed length one. And the fixed length one, you're going to need to kind of mark which pages are which. It hopefully will automatically do this, but if not, you may need to mark it. You are responsible for uploading your assignments and for it being uploaded. 
you get like an email receipt and stuff. So, you know, I, uh, sometimes with Canvas, I've heard people say they uploaded it and they thought it was there and then it wasn't there. With Gradescope, you should get a receipt. So you should actually get this, okay? Um, so you'll be responsible for that. Okay, great. You're all, someone has trained you well, hopefully, on how to use Gradescope. So I don't, I don't have to do that. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, any other questions about course mechanics? Okay, great. So let's, um, yeah, I just wanna again say this, there's this day science day tomorrow, you're all welcome to come. There's, a, if you're curious about this at all, it'd be a great opportunity to find out about this and talk to a lot of people and hear some kind of exciting speakers. And there's a, a research expo with posters and stuff, and you can meet people, learn about different graduate programs and stuff. So I encourage you all to, all to do that. Um, hopefully I'll, it's been distracting me. I've been kind of the main organizer for that. So that's been taking a bunch of my time uh, recently. Okay, um, great. Okay, before we get into the lecture, I wanna talk a little bit about, so, um, so names, I, I guess in this course, um, yeah, so two things about names. One is about, um, um, so pronouns, my pronouns um, are um, he and um, um, so him. If you, if you want to um, let me know your pronouns, maybe you have a name that is, you know, uh, that is not common in, um, um, so in Utah, you might want to let me know your pronouns or any reason you want to do that. You can do that on Canvas. Um, the other thing I want to say about names is I would prefer to be referred to as, so, um, um, so Prof. Philip. So if you write me an email, that's an easy way to refer to me. Um, so kind of for definitely for, so for, for some of my colleagues, they would like the professors to be addressed more formally for various reasons. And I'm kind of, you know, supporting all of my colleagues by asking you all to do the same. Okay, so if, if you will um, call me Prof Phillips, I will call you, try and refer to you by your preferred name and pronouns as listed in campus. Um, so, okay, great. So let's get into the sample spaces and events and maybe we'll get to probability by, uh, by the end of the lecture. All right. Um, so, okay, so, all right. So in order to define probability, um, we are like, if, yeah. So before I get started, right, there's actually kind of, kind of in the kind of, space of like of of like education in probability and statistics there are kind of three levels of how people have taught like probability um originally when it was taught like 40 or 40 or so years ago 30 40 years ago it was usually only taught through measure theory um and measure theory is kind of a fairly advanced form of mathematics with a lot of technical details in it that I kind of mostly know, but I don't feel totally comfortable with. And they don't teach it that way anymore. They figured out there's a simpler way to teach it through calculus. And you don't quite need all the details of measure theory for specifically for people like engineers and computer scientists, people doing things like machine learning. They don't need all the nuances of measure theory most of the time. Um, there's a, there's a newer, there's kind of a different version that's been more common in some places now. That's if you take like there's a math 1070 or something, which teaches an intro to probability without using calculus. Um, this kind of refers to um, kind of just discrete objects and talks about probability kind of like fractions and how to use it. Um, we're gonna sit this somewhere in the middle. We're gonna use a calculus Based version of so probability in this class allows talk about continuous random variables, um, which is going to be important for modeling real world data um, in in so various ways. Okay, but I say that because the foundation of all of this is based on so sets the underlying objects that 
inherit the probability you discuss about them, the basic mathematical object is going to be a set, okay? And so that's what we need to start with and review some of this if you've had um, a discrete math class or seen set someplace else before. Okay, so to make sure where everyone's on the same level, we have to start with kind of sets, okay? These are like a collection of so, so unique objects, right? Think of these like um, schools in the Pac-12, right? That might be changing in a few years, unfortunately, I guess. Um, you know, but it, it, it could be discrete objects like they're currently, what is it? How many schools are there in Pac-12? Is it 14, 16? 12, it's, it's, it is 12. All right. <laughs> that should have been obvious, right? Okay. Um, I remember it was Pac-8 before, but okay. Um, okay, so, but it could be kind of things like some numbers or like, so colors, like how many different, so colors are there? Are, are there a finite number of colors? You know, if you're on a computer, there might be a finite number of colors, right? Uh, you have R, G, B, each um, red, green, and blue value each between zero and, two, uh, zero and 255 maybe. But maybe in nature, there's an infinite number of colors. That's still a valid set, the set of all colors. If two, and they're kind of just, but if you, have, if you have two people wearing the exactly same, so shade of red, those are the same color, okay? So these are unique objects that those are not, Two different colors even though two different people are wearing those so shades of red okay so an example typically it's often often like abstracting say okay they're just numbers three eight and 31 this is a set we'll write it in this notation where there are these kind of um these brackets that have the have the squiggles on them right here and this indicates it's a set and the elements will be separated by commas in between the sets right and we'll usually use an uppercase letter to describe the set. This is kind of the common notation. If you see a, a lowercase a, it's probably not a set. It's probably something else that we might talk about later in the class, okay? Um, you know, you could also have like uh, words. These are all words of fruit, you know? Um, okay, this is not a valid set, see? Okay, you see it's got, let's see, it's got, um, an uppercase letter, that's, we said that was good. It's got these curly brackets. They're separated by commas, but there's some reason it's not a set. Yeah. Yeah, great. It's got duplicate values. The two occurs twice, right? Okay, so it's set, you'd only write elements, so, so which are unique, right? It's like if you listed the schools in the Pac-12 and you listed, you know, so you listed the University of Utah twice, that's, so that's not useful, right? So this would, you could call this like a, so a multi-set. We won't be dealing with multi-sets, okay? If you're a computer scientist, you build a day structure, which is a set, and you have just the first four elements into it, one, two, three, four, and you insert a two, what does the day structure do? Um, so right, right, so the data structure does nothing. It already has two in the set, so it doesn't need to update anything, right? So if you insert, so a set is, is just unique elements, okay? Um, okay, um, the order does not matter either, right? So one, two, three, and three, one, two are the same set, okay? The order is, <laughs> does not matter. We'll deal with ordered sets before later, and that might be one, two, three, if I use a kind of um, a parentheses instead of the curly brackets, then this is not equal to three, one, two, then the order here is, is gonna be important. But for, for sets, right, um, that's because I use the, um, the parentheses instead of the curly brackets, okay? So you gotta keep track of this sort of thing. That those those are different things because of this notation. Um, an element of a set is used this this kind of so symbol, um, right? If you were to write this in so LaTeX, this would be slash in. So X is in the set A, 
That's the symbol that X is in the set A. So one is in the set. If I call this, this set A, then one is in the set, two is in the set, three is in the set. But if X is not in the set A, right, then four is not in that set. So that's not in. Okay, so just remember this notation. Um, and then an important kind of special set is going to, is going to be the empty set. The empty set is called that because it's empty. There's nothing in the set. Curly brackets with nothing in between, right? And I'll use this, so this null symbol sometimes to represent the empty set. Okay, so, okay. Um, okay, so some important sets. These will sometimes be useful for shorthand so notation. Um, this is the set Z, and this is like a blackboard bold Z. If you want to write, if you're if you're writing in chalk, or if I'm writing on the whiteboard, and I like to write Z, and I and I want it to be bold, I could just kind of squiggle, 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 and make it thicker. But what the convention is just to draw any vertical lines to make them kind of like like an extra one there. Okay, and so this is, you can do this in LaTeX and symbols as well. And that's what's going on here. Okay, um, and so those are the, the integers are all kind of count, kind of the counting numbers, but also going negative and zero. The natural numbers start at zero. Um, this is my probably favorite thing to work with. The, so the real numbers. Um, and the, the reason is kind of, the integers are kind of easy to describe. They're like counting and you have, have negatives, but the mathematics of dealing with the integers involves things like primes. And there's lots of uncertainty in how to, what you can do with integers in mathematics is very complicated. The real numbers are kind of a complicated concept, right? The real numbers are any value you can write in, a, in the form of like a decimal, right? Some examples, pi, so in, is a real number, it's decimal, you know, doesn't really have a pattern in it, and it so goes on forever, but it's a real number. So they're kind of complicated to describe what is a real number, but they're really easy to work with as an abstraction, so mathematically, okay? In a computer, we don't actually store real numbers. We have like doubles and floats and stuff like that, but we pretend that they're real numbers, and it mostly works out, okay? Um, and there are parts of computer science where pretending the real numbers does not work out if you're dealing with very, very large scale, so like simulations, uh, you need to be really careful about this. Where I work in big data, machine learning sort of stuff, you can pretend a, a, a double is a real number or even a float is a real number and it just pretty much just works. Okay, so, um, so I like real numbers, really useful abstraction. Any possible number, okay. Um, probably say a little bit more about continuity and stuff when we get to kind of continuous random variables. Okay. Um, okay. Um, all right. There's another notation that we'll use. And I mean, the reason for this notation, yeah. So, like, I, I, I've gotten students before and said, I'm really annoyed at all this notation you're using. It's really, I don't like all these weird symbols. Why do you have to use these weird symbols? Um, it's, it ends up being a lot easier than not using the weird symbols is, is pretty much why, right? This is kind of a shorthand notation. It's like a language to describe these sort of things. And it's stuck with us because it's very useful. Um, okay, so, so what is this saying? This is saying the natural numbers, okay, so um, our, Okay, the natural numbers, N, right? We defined that, we just, all right, showed what that was on the previous slide. These are the integers, the integer values. So, um, so such that, such that X, the value is greater or equal to zero, right? So these are the numbers zero, one, two, up to, yeah, so they keep going. Okay, um, so, so, so that's the, that dot or the, the colon in the middle says, so such that. So it says, well, it's part of the set of 
of the integers, but this condition, this condition must hold for it to be in the particular set I'm defining here. Okay. With probability, we'll use a slightly different notation, but a similar idea. So, so th this is important. If you've seen this before, we'll talk about so conditional probability in a week or so, and that has a similar but slightly different notation, but it's a similar concept. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's a the set of even integers, right? So x is in the integers, but x is so divisible by two, meaning if you divide x by two, it's still going to be an integer. Okay, um, that's the even integers, right? That's um, um, kind of zero, two, four, six up here, but also includes minus two, minus four, and dot, dot, dot that way as well. Okay, um, all right. And so, so the rational numbers is another pretty weird set of kind of um, challenging to work with set of so values, um, which is they're kind of like a subset of the real numbers, but they're defined by two integers, one divided by the other. Okay. The nice thing about the rationals is a computer can always store a rational number, right? If I can make if I can make the integers large enough, um, so I can describe a rational number by um, two integers. Um, if, if I make the large enough, these become dense in the real numbers, so it works well for the real numbers. Um, yeah, so I, sometimes rationals are, are useful to work with, too. Um, probably won't do too much with rationals in this course. Okay. Um, okay, a subset is, okay, a set is a subset of another set B. Let's turn on. Um, Keep looking. Okay, my, oh. um, okay, so A is a subset of another set B if every element of A is also um, um, if A is also an element of B. Okay, so some examples here. Um, so one nine is a subset of one three nine eleven, right? Because um, we have one and nine. These are elements in here. Okay. Sorry, my the screen is just like flashing colors at me now. So I'm a little distracted up here. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a, it's it heard me talking about these uh, so sets of colors. This is really weird. It's very distracting. Okay, one. Okay, hopefully. Okay, I've I've turned it off. Good. Okay. Um, right. The 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 rationals are um are a subset of the reals I mentioned. Oh, okay. Apple and pear is not a set of this fruit set, right? What's wrong here? Why is this not a subset? Yeah. Yeah. So pear is not in the fruit on the right. So this is not this apple orange. Uh, so banana set. Yeah. So yeah. So if my kids want an apple and a pear for a snack. And these are on, and the ones on the right are what I have currently in my kitchen. It means I have to go to the store or they're gonna start crying or something. So, um, okay. And then the, and then the empty set is a, is a um, subset for any set A. Um, oh, we need to talk about a little slightly different notation. Um, yeah, so, so what is, if I say A is not a subset of A, what is, um, yeah, wh what is going on here? So this, the, the empty set is a subset for any set A, that's always, always true by definition, but let's see, there's two weird statements here. A is a subset of A, and A is not a subset of A. What's different in these notations? Yeah. Yeah, there's this little bar at the bottom here, right? You notice that little bar under there. Okay, so this means this um, A subset B, this with no bar, um, no bar, this is called a strict, 
so a subset. And that means that A is strictly smaller than B. That means there must be some element of B that is not an A. This means some X in B such that um, X not in A, okay, is not in A and A is gonna be a subset of B, right? So, well, I said that part already, but it satisfies, um, yeah, here's what I can say. So it's A is a subset of B as I defined here, but there's some element in B that is not in A, right? So um, A is not a strict subset of itself. This example, if I look at um, this example up here, I could have used the strict subset in this case, right? I could have said um, three is an element of the set on the right, right? But is not an element of one nine, okay? So this would be a strict subset. Um, this is kind of an annoying distinction and it's very easy to miss, right? It's, it, it was, you know, if, if you know what you're looking for, you can spot that little line underneath the, the, the subset to know it's not necessarily a strict subset. Um, and so this is a common sort of mistake that instructors will make when they're writing stuff on during the lecture or on exams or on homework. I hope I don't make it, but I might accidentally can, you know, not write a the full subset and sometimes write the strict subset for simplicity. And sometimes they'll mean something slightly different. Usually they act the same way. Okay, so hopefully everything in this class will not have confusion about that. If there is an important distinction, I will try and make it. When we deal with continuous random variables, this will almost like, there will be reasons why the distinction pretty much won't matter um, in, in, in almost, almost all cases. Sometimes in discrete sets, it can, it can matter in some ways. But I, I'll try and not hide the fact if we need to pay attention to if it's a subset or a strict subset. Okay. So hopefully we don't need to worry about this, but there it is. Okay. Yep. The Q. The Q are the rational numbers, right? So the Q, too many transitions. The rationals, right? So the rationals are any fraction, right? The fractions can be greater than one, can be less than one, they can be negative, but they need to be written as um, P over Q or P and Q are going to be integers. Was an example of a real number that's not a rational number. You wanna know? And back? Uh, square root of two, great, yeah. Uh, so, so, oh, oh, like E, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the natural numbers are N, but the natural number is E, yes, that's right. So. Uh, the, the base of, uh, uh, so the base of log when you do ln, we'll actually see E all later in this class, it'll be so super important. If you're in electrical engineering, you know how important E is probably already. If you're in computer science, you might not know how important E is yet, okay? E is very important, uh, the natural number E, right? That's, um, right, E is about 2.71 dot, 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 okay. Turns out it's a really important number. Okay. All right, where are we? Okay. Um, so sample spaces, these are, um, okay, these are sets in action. These are, this, these are the renaming kind of of a set for use within probability, okay? Um, okay, a sample space is a particular set that we're interested in when describing some probabilities, and we will get to um, kind of um, probabilities, um, okay? Um, and we'll generally denote sample set by, so this symbol, this is, um, so is gonna be an, a, so omega, O, so omega, it's, a, it's an uppercase omega, um, May if you've taken algorithms, that means like a like a lower bound, but we'll use it as the as kind of this the sample space, the set of the possible outcomes that we care about when we disguise when you discuss a probability. Sometimes this is kind of implicit. 
um, what the sample space is, but for at least for the beginning of the course, we'll try and make this very explicit. Um, when you deal with continuous distributions, um, it's often like the space of, of real numbers, and then you kind of don't talk about it so much. Um, but when you have discrete distributions, you need to, you, you really need to pay attention to what is the sample space, okay? Um, okay, so an example, if you're flipping a coin, this will be a kind of a pretty simple common example we use in the course. A coin flip, it has two outcomes. It has heads or tails, right? So be heads, this one will be um, tails, right? Um, okay, if I flip a coin, is there any other possible outcome? Yeah, it could it could kind of land on the edge. Um, that's that's pretty rare. Maybe you toss it up so high it escapes the atmosphere. Um, yeah, but we'll talk about you know pr probability is about kind of simplifying your assumptions so you can model stuff easily. So we'll say coin flip is a heads or a tails. Okay, we'll sometimes use these simplifying assumptions. Okay, hopefully, you know most of you probably would not have thought that was a simplifying assumption, but it could be right. Okay, so heads and tails is coin flip. All right. Um, if you, so, if you roll a die, there are six sides: one, two, three, four, five, six. Right. Okay, and those are the 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 possible outcomes of so rolling a die. Okay, yeah, it might roll off the table or land on a weird edge or something, or you might have a twelve-sided die. You know, but if you have a six-sided die. We're gonna say these are the outcomes, okay? These are the possible things that could happen. We're gonna restrict our understanding to just thinking about these outcomes, okay? Um, right, if you, okay. Um, if you pick a ball from a bucket or like an urn, sometimes they will refer to a bucket as like an, an urn. We'll think of, I don't know, how many people have, have heard the word urn before? Okay, do you, you're, Parents have an urn in their house or something. It's a, uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of a big vase or a pot or a bucket that you can put stuff in and you can take stuff out of it. All right. Um, and there's might be, let's see, there's supposed to be a a ball, which is is red, and might be interesting if there is um, if there are more balls which are blue. Okay, but the outcome is either a red ball or a ball that's blue. Okay, um, so 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 or I says red and black. Okay, I I need to redo this drawing. Okay, otherwise it'll be super confusing. Um, okay, good. Now there are four black balls and one red ball. Okay, and um, so that that might be the outcome. Okay. Or those are the possible outcomes are only red and black. Okay. Um, okay. What if I toss not just one coin, but I toss two coins? What are the possible outcomes? Um, yeah. Can you can you say that a bit louder? Okay. Two heads. Two tails, and you said heads and tails. Okay. There's one more possible outcome. Yeah, you can also do tails and heads. Um, if you keep, typically when you do this, you keep track of which coin is which. Um, so you, you could say the coins are indistinguishable and you report it, but typically when you think about flipping distinct coins, then there are the heads and tails, and tails and heads might be distinct outcomes. Okay, if I were to say, okay, how many tails are there afterwards? Well, then there are only three possible outcomes. I could have zero tails, two tails, or one tail, right? And the last two cases both give me one tail, right? But these, you think of these are the four possible outcomes here, okay? If I had 10 coins I flipped, how many possible outcomes could I have then under, under this model where the coins are distinct? Yep, not 10 factorial, we'll get to factorial later, close. There. Yeah, right, so if you, have, if you have 10 coins, it's gonna be the, this, this sample space, 
well, we'll say, I'll just say the size of the sample space is going to be two to the power 10, right? So this is because every time I flip a new coin, I have, I can append <coughs> another coin flip onto the end of this. This could be heads or tails. This could be appended by heads or tails, uh, heads or tails, uh, heads or tails. And I went from four outcomes with two to eight outcomes with three. If I do a fourth one, it's going to be 16 outcomes and eventually two to the power 10. That's two times two times two times 10 times. Okay. This is kind of a useful insight, you know, to, to, to see. Okay. What if, if I had uh, so a six sided die and I rolled it four times? How many possible outcomes? All right. I'd, 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 yeah, I rolled it four times or I rolled four dies and I kept track of each of them. Yeah. Yeah, right. So if I had four, if I had four um, times six um, sided die, then I would have a six to the power four. So outcomes, right? Each one gives me six and I multiply all the, all those, um, all those options together. Right. Okay. Yeah, how about, okay, now how about I shuffling a deck of 52 cards? How many, how many ways can I shuffle a deck of 52 cards? Right there, the mask. Yeah, this one is factorial, right? This one is, I'll, I'll define factorial a bit later. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just do it now. The factorial means I'm very excited that you got the answer correctly. Um, exclamation point is one times two times three cool. times up to uh, 51 times 52. I usually write multiplication by a dot. Hope that's okay, that's not clear. The X is I use for variables and stuff, okay. Um, right, so you can write this as a product. Uh, this is kind of like a sum notation, uh, I equals one up to 52 times I. That's, a, that's equivalent to this, okay? The, that's an uppercase. It looks like an uppercase pi. It's a it's some notation. All right. You, you probably don't need to know that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Yeah. So that's product notation. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. It's like some notation, but if I, instead of I sum up all the elements, I multiply them all together, then, uh, then that's what's going on there. Okay. You, it's, uh, I'm just rambling a little bit there. Okay. Um, so events. Okay. So um, sample spaces are what could happen. And event is kind of a set of things that you're interested if those happen. Okay. So it's, we talked about sets and subsets. Now we have sample spaces and so events, right? Um, so basically event maps to a subset. Okay. So um, so if you roll a die and you get an even number, right? I can describe it in words as an even number, but mathematically I can say, well, of the one, two, three, four, five, six, the even numbers are just two, four, and six, okay? So this is a, is a subset. Um, okay, if you flip a coin and, and it comes up heads, okay? A head is a subset of heads and tails, okay? Um, yeah, your code takes longer than five seconds to run. Okay, I'd write the subset, the event in this way. Okay, this is maybe worth unpacking. So, so like a little bit, um, I'm measuring time in so seconds here, and that's kind of implicit in this, in, in this notation. All right, it's a subset of the real numbers, right? So real numbers, the actual amount of time Right, maybe I can only measure time in some finite amount of measurement, but time could be any value. It could be the natural number e two point seven one dot 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 dot. That might be the time, probably not, but uh, it it could be the time. It could be any real number, and I'm interested if it's um, greater, longer than five seconds. Okay, so I've got I've got the five here. This is an interval. Okay, I when I 
Yeah, this notation is, is an interval between five and infinity, okay? In between five and infinity, so right? So it's, think of there's a real line, um, right? It goes from negative infinity to infinity. It's usually useful to write zero on this line someplace, okay? And then there's a special spot here that's five, and what I'm interested in is the interval from five up to infinity. And I'll write this as the interval from five up to infinity here. This describes the interval on the real number line. It's a continuous line of all possible values. No, so it's longer than five, right? Yeah, so, um, right, so it says longer than five, not longer or equal to five, so it does not include five. And so that is signified by having the, using the parentheses, the rounded brackets. If I had said, um, if instead I had uh, said um, longer or equal to five um, seconds, then I would write a square bracket five to, so five to infinity, right? The difference here, the or equal um, means that I use the square bracket here, but if I don't want to include five, then I use the, the so the open bracket, the parentheses, okay? Um, again, this is kind of like the difference between a subset and a strict subset. It typically won't matter very much, but technically they're slightly different, okay? Um, so those mean different things in the notation of, so the interval's there. Why do I have uh, uh, the rounded bracket, the parentheses on the right side there, on the, uh, so around infinity? Yep. Oh. Well, um, it's not necessarily the right answer. Some code will, will take forever, uh, at least in theory. Probably your, the world will end before then, but um, yeah. Um, my guess is that infinity is Yeah, infinity is technically not a real number. It's not actually a number. It's a concept that's some quant, representing a quantity larger than all real numbers, right? It's this, uh, that's this kind of hard to formally define what is in infinity. It's kind of a mathematical concept that's larger than everything. Okay, but it's not actual a value of how long the code took to run. Um, yeah, you, um, yeah, you, if you wanted to include infinity, right, the technically the right way to write this, um, and sometimes you might want to do that. In fact, it's, it's not computable to know if your code will ever stop or not, so it might take infinity. But if I wanted to include infinity, I would write five in infinity um, union infinity. It might take forever, right? So I have to add to the real numbers, I add a special element infinity that's n it's now no longer a subset of the real numbers. But that's how you would write it if you wanted to allow your code to take forever to run. Um, yeah. The square bracket means that it includes five. Yeah, so this means this includes five in the set. This one does not include five. Okay, with the open bracket, it does not include five. With the square bracket, it does include five. Um, that's not the, how the mathematical notation is written. Uh, yeah, so that, that would not, um, there, okay, you would get into the measure theory we're not going to get into for the reasons why you don't do that, but you don't do that, uh, for, for reasons we're not going to get into. Uh, this, this doesn't matter. This is just me kind of rambling a little bit. Okay. Um, 
Okay, I, I already kind of skipped ahead a little bit with that with uh, that symbol with infinity, but uh, okay, the, the union is gonna be important. Uh, the union of two sets is all the elements in either sets or both, okay? If you're been doing logic, especially you electrical engineers, you probably are been careful about, does it include or both or not? Those are different gates uh, slightly, I guess. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so, you know, if A and B, if we think of these as events instead of as uh, sets, right, then it means either event A happened or event B happened, right? So it's kind of like an or here is what the, the union is, is representing. Um, and it could be both of them happen, okay? It's, um, okay, um, yeah, let me say something here, another, a very useful way, I, I'm a very kind of, I like, so geometry. So I like to draw pictures a lot, okay? And this is the first part where I think it really helps to think of a picture, okay? So we're gonna have a space and we're gonna have um, two sets in the space, A and B, right? So, so what I'm drawing is a Venn diagram here. Okay, typically a Venn diagram might just draw A and B, but I started with this box on the outside because this box on, on the outside is the sample space, okay? And I'm gonna need to keep, with probability, you need to keep track of the sample space. It's otherwise you kind of, uh, you don't know how to like normalize your probability, it turns out, okay? So um, now the union of A and B, all right, is going to be the part inside of B, okay? And also the part inside of A, okay? It's, it's, it's either the, the 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 um the pink or the green part or the part that's in the green and the pink that's um kind of gray dark green area okay it could be that as well that is a union of a and b as a as a venn diagram we're gonna some of the things you ask me to do will be a little bit more complicated than this and the venn diagram is kind of a very intuitive way i think to understand what's going on and if you draw the venn diagram it's a lot harder to make a mistake Okay, it's, you can, you can solve a lot of the questions, say on the homework without doing Venn diagrams and most of the time you'll be fine. But if you draw the Venn diagram, you will almost much less likely make a mistake on it. So I recommend to do it. It's not hard. It's a nice little picture. You won't get penalized for drawing pictures on your homework if you draw Venn diagrams. Um, yeah, so a good friend of mine in college was taking a, a so he was taking a course in chemistry on one of the midterms. He didn't know the answer. He drew a really nice picture of a horse. The TA gave him one point for the horse. He, he ultimately got the lowest C minus in the class by one point because he drew a nice little picture down there. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it, but, you know, got into med school and everything because of that horse picture. Um, your, let your horse picture be the Venn diagram. Right? Okay. Um, okay. If it, I, I really believe this in a lot of these problems, if you can draw an appropriate picture, it'll really prevent you from making mistakes. It's not just for kind of looks pretty. Okay. Um, okay, here's some examples, All right? Um, if, if I'm rolling again, implicitly a six-sided die, okay? And an odd roll is one, three, and five. Uh, an even roll, and all rolls less than three are one, two, and three. What's the sample space here? Right, so we start with the sample space. Think of this as a picture, but really it's one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Implicitly, this is the sample space here. It's a six-sided die, right? And I can even draw a um, picture here in my picture, one, two, three, four, five, six, these boxes. Okay, so now set, a is going to be one, three, and five. And set B is gonna be one, two, and three. And then the union of A and B, 
the union of A and B is going to be, I can, you know, one, two, three, and, and five, anything that's colored in, right? One and three are counted twice, but that's, that's fine. Okay, and you, yeah, great. Um, yeah, that wasn't a really useful Venn diagram, but I promise you, we'll, we'll ask you to do more complicated stuff without, without examples like dice and stuff to discrete things to work through. Okay, the intersection, similarly, I wrote it as the, um, as this, this upside down union, the union is kind of like a big U, um, kind of the, the union is written in LaTeX cup, right? And this is written as, um, this is written as, a, so cap, okay? Um, yeah, if you, um, yeah, I like describing in LaTeX because mathematical notation, if you write it on a slide, it's very precise what the symbol means. If, if, if I write it by my hand, uh, I try and make it so it's distinct from other symbols that should be distinct from, but my handwriting sometimes isn't, isn't perfect. So um, yeah, so C-A-P, this is a kind of a, a, loss, a lossless encoding of, of what the symbol is. Um, okay, all right. Um, okay, when A and B are events, yeah, it means that um, both of the events happen, so A and B. Again, the, the Venn diagram here, you have your sample space, you have A, um, this is uh, B, this is A, and that's B. And then the intersection of the two of them is when both of them happen here. So this is, um, this is A intersect B. That's where both A and B both happened. Okay, it's in both of those sets. All right. Okay, so the what is the intersection of an odd roll and a roll of three or less? What's the inter intersection here of A intersection B? <coughs> Just writing as a set over there. One and three, yeah. Uh, yeah, one, three, right? Because what happens in both? One is in both and, and three is in both, but two is not, is only in B and five is only in A. Okay, so that's the intersection. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, if A and B, uh, if the A intersection B are, so the empty set, we say that they are so disjoint, right? So again, with the sample space Venn diagram picture, you have, you have A and, and you have B, right? And now those circles are not overlapping with each other anywhere and they're disjoint. The intersection is the empty set, okay? Okay, the, so the complement, okay? The complement is again, where you really need to pay attention to the sample space, right? If you have a sample space, here and I have a set A, then the complement is everything that's not in the set A, right? So the complement is everything out here. All right, so that is, this is going to be a complement. And this is implicitly defined by the sample space. I have to have the sample space defined here, otherwise this won't make sense. Okay, I, I need this to be kind of, um, you need it to actually be finite, otherwise a lot of weird stuff happens. Again, with measure theory, you can avoid this if you want to, but we're not gonna deal with it. Okay, all right. Um, it means that A does not happen. And so it means that if you have a sample space, it's something in the sample space happened because something in the sample space always happens because that's what can happen, but it was not something in A, okay? so. Uh, d d um, let's see, yeah, an odd roll, the complement of an odd roll is gonna be an even roll, right? It's one, two, three, four, five, or six. Those are the only outcomes we consider for our die, six-sided die, and it was not an odd roll. The complement of A is then has to be an even roll, two, four, and six. Okay. All right, uh, the difference, the difference between two sets. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Um, 
So the difference between two sets is basically subtraction. Sometimes it's called so like a um, so like a set minus. Um, I think often the difference assumes that B is a. Sometimes it assumes B is a is a subset of A, but that doesn't always have to be true. Okay, so um, so it's you look at the elements of A and you take out the elements that are in B. Um, let's see if we can, and then there's a note here, A minus B, right? Minus means kind of intuitively, you remove the part that's in B, but it can't go negative, okay? Um, is the intersection of A and B complement? Okay, the difference, the reason, uh, you know, I sometimes don't use the minuses. Minus, you might think you can get like a negative element, like if B was three, five, and one, then you might think A minus B is four, six, and negative one. But negative one was not in the sample space. You can't roll a negative one with the dot. So you don't want to include that, right? So, um, but with sets, you, you don't get anything negative. Okay. Um, so for the sample, well, yeah, if you had, a die that if it landed on the ceiling, you got the negative number or something, then yeah, but then your sample space would be bigger. Okay, so um, th then, then um, but that you still wouldn't get, you know, so a negative value. Um, let's see if we can derive this using Venn diagrams. This A minus B is equal to A intersect B, so complement, okay? Um, Okay, let's first do this with A and B. This is this is A, and we're going to do A minus B. So it's the part of A that does not overlap B. Okay, so what would we draw? That's going to be the elements here. Okay, I'm not I'm not drawing negative values in the green here. That's not what I'm doing, okay? Don't, don't do that. It's just the parts of A, okay, um, um, is in this, um, that are in A, but not in B, okay? So this is A minus B, okay? This is A minus B. And let's see if we can rederive this with our rules of, we're gonna have A, and we're gonna intersect this with, with B complement. So B complement are going to be the parts that are in A and B. I mean, A and um, A and B complement. Okay. So B complement is all of this stuff here. Okay. And then if I draw the parts in A, it's everything in the, in the, in the circle here. Okay, and the part that's in the intersection of both of those sets is going to be the, the same thing here. The part that's in both of those shadings, that's gonna be A intersect B complement. And that's the same picture I drew above, right? It's, it's the same kind of part of the space. It's in A, but it's not in B. Okay, so with Venn diagrams, you can kind of get to the same answer multiple ways and it's, you know, good. I think it's in two, yeah. If there's one in the what? Um, oh, if there's one in, in A. Yeah, well then uh, it's going to be an A minus B. Then you'll have A minus B is one, four, six, because one is not in B. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, let's. Let's stop here. Uh, there's a bit kind of some more complicated stuff, but we will finish these slides in the next lecture on Tuesday. I'm stopping about 15 minutes early because the, the first quiz is opening. Once you, reminder, you do not have to finish until end of the day on Friday. Um, we're gonna be quiet in the classroom now. So if you have to get up and leave, you need to do it really quietly. Um, or maybe we'll give you five minutes to leave and then we'll definitely have quiet time. Um, if you, uh, but I recommend you take it now if you have your computer, we'll be around to help and answer, um, to 
help and answer questions. Yeah. No notes on the quizzes. So just be your, just, well, oh, oh yeah, yeah. You can use, you can use your own, yeah. You can use your own notes or anything linked off the, off, off the webpage. Yeah, it's pretty much open book. Don't like search the internet, okay? But you can use your notes and stuff linked off the webpage. And it's just going to be, just a reminder, it's just going to be on the, uh, the class mechanics. It's 10 minutes once you start. I expect it will, should not take more than five minutes, okay? And if you're on Zoom, you can ask questions on, on Zoom directed at, at Mesarm or, or Anna. 